Acts chapter 6, if you have your Bibles here with you this morning. Now, this is not going to be a Father's Day message, but I would like to use the occasion of Father's Day to introduce our text and our theme for this particular day. Biblically and practically, what distinguishes good fathers from not so good fathers are priorities. I have some good news for you dads this morning. You don't have to be cool. Some of you ought to say amen. You didn't get it. Okay. Um, It's okay. You don't have to have a certain skill set. You don't have to have a lot of money. You do need right priorities. Priorities are the big things. They are prior. That is, they are before other things. They are important. They have precedence. Here's a thing I want you to consider. If your priority is merely pleasing your children, you have poor priorities. And all the kids said, boo. (laughs) Priorities are manifest or known in what we do and not in what we say. It's very easy to talk about priorities. It's very easy to say that we have the right priorities. If I passed around a little test this morning that said, you know, these are the right priorities, most of you would, would write true. It's a lot easier to, to say you have the right priorities than to actually live those priorities out because right priorities require hard decisions and they require uh, activity. They're not present in passivity. You don't wait for right priorities to be manifest in your life. You choose them, and you make decisions in light of them. And remember that in establishing priorities, a choice to do one thing is always a choice to not do something else. And in spite of what the commercials tell us, we cannot have it all, and we cannot do it all. Now, men, just for a moment, biblically speaking, I can tell you the will of God for your first two priorities. Number one, God. God should be your pride. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. That both speaks of his nature and the place that he ought to take in our lives. And the second, if you are married, the second priority ought to be your wife. Dads, in addition to loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you should love your wife. It's one of the best things that you can possibly do for your children is to love their mother. Now, I didn't say you can always make your wife happy. I said said love her. There's a difference sometimes between those two things, but that is a message for another day. All that said, fathers, if your children are walking with the Lord, you shouldn't take too much credit. And if they are not walking with the Lord, you shouldn't take too much blame. Children, have their own priorities to establish. They have a capability of making choices and they'll have to establish their priorities just as you had to establish yours. Now you might say, well how does that introduce our text today? Well simply put, priorities are not only important for the home, they are important for the local church. Acts chapter six on the surface seems to be about social work or organization or administration or perhaps an introduction to Stephen, the first martyr. All of those things are actually there, but there is a a subplot to all of this and a sub-theme to all of this that's really the main thing, and the main thing is about priorities. Now just in context, if you haven't been with us, that we've been studying the book of Acts from the beginning and we've learned that there have been two rounds of persecution so far, things that have come from outside the church uh, brought about by false religion attempting to squelch the work of the church. Now we get a little break from that and we get another glimpse into the daily life of the church and so let's look at it in Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Now, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, 
whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, and Pumba. No, that's <laughs> Timon and Parmenas. And Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, the first thing you notice in this text is the growth pains. The church was growing. In fact, believers were not only being added, it said that the number of disciples was being multiplied. And I think the reason for that is this, that there were so many people now that had found the good life in Jesus that they were also helping other people come to life in Christ. So this was not just the apostles preaching and people believing the word of the apostles. Now there's a second and third wave, if you will, of evangelism that's taking place. And so it's exponential growth taking place at this particular point. I don't know how they arrive at this number, but I read a couple of guys who believe that there were as many as 20,000 believers in Jerusalem at this particular point in time. Now think about that. At the resurrection, you know, you had maybe 500, you know, of people who saw Christ risen, and and then you had that day of Pentecost and 3,000, and then you had the next wave, and there were 5,000, and and if there were 20,000, I mean, it's just incredible what happens when the people of God embrace the life of God and proclaim the word of God to people who don't know God. This thing keeps moving and there's this multiplication of life. Notice the word disciples that is used in this particular text. It's distinguished from the apostles. Verse 40, it talks about the apostles. They were called for and they were beaten. We talked about that last week. We'll see the word apostles again in this particular text. But this, is, this word disciples is distinguished from the apostles this time, from the 12. Jesus had commissioned the apostles to make disciples in Matthew chapter 28. He said, in your going, make disciples of all kinds of people. A disciple is an apprentice of Christ, a, a student or a learner, somebody who is actually learning to do what Jesus did and taking on his character and likeness. I'll give you another Discover Calvary story. This past Wednesday, I was talking about apprenticeship, and I asked the people in the class, I said, have any of you ever been an apprentice before? And one guy said, yes, I have. And I said, tell me about that. And he said, well, I was assigned to another guy as a grunt, and I had to do what he, what he did, and the, the purpose was that I would watch him do what he did, and uh, eventually I would do what he did in the way that he did it. <laughs> That's it. I mean, that's apprenticeship. That's discipleship with Jesus. When we are calling you, friends, to come to Jesus, what we're saying is spend enough time with Jesus so that you can do what he did in the way that he did it. That's apprenticeship. And that's what's going on here. So the the apostles were inviting people. They had become disciples. They were learners of students of Jesus. And more and more people were taking on the likeness of Jesus and doing what he did. Now, at the end of chapter 4, the people were unified as a church, and no one among them lacked anything. Now, a lot of people stop studying the church at that particular point in the Bible, and they go, man, that was it right there, you know. They had it going on. The church was unified, and everything was great, and nobody had any needs. Friends, that is a snapshot, and life is a video. Nothing stays like that. You know, we, we prove that all the time on social media. You, 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 people put up this, this, this picture of themselves. If you actually know them, their life is a mess probably. But boy, on, on social media, they're the happiest family <gasps> since Beaver and Cleaver and whatever those people's names were. You know, I mean, it's just all wonderful and rosy. And yeah, right, that's their snapshot. But life is a video, okay? And that changed. A division was developing among the people because the needs of some people were not being met. There were two groups of people among the Jewish people living in Jerusalem. There were Greek-speaking Jewish people that had become believers, and there were Hebrew-speaking Jewish people that had become believers. 
The problem is the Greek-speaking Jewish believers had come from other places. They were part of what we call the diaspora or the dispersion, and they were coming back to Jerusalem. And when they came back to Jerusalem, they brought their culture with them. They brought the culture of Rome and, and Syria and other places like that. They brought that back. So they spoke a different language. They had a different culture. And guess what? They even used a different Bible translation. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? They used the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that was made possible to the Greek-speaking uh, people, the, Greek, the, the common, the Koine Greek. And so you've got people now that are actually Jewish people that are using a different Bible translation, living a different culture, speaking a different language, but they're Jewish people and they're living in Jerusalem and they're followers of Jesus. You might say they were modern day refugees. They had come into this. Now somehow, and most people don't believe it was intentional, but somehow those widows of that group were being missed in the distribution of money and food. And it started to cause a bit of a division. Now, whether it was actually because people were on purpose avoiding this particular group, or whether that particular group, you know how people sometimes do when you have a victim mentality, you're like, yeah, I see how this is. Yeah, I, I see how this is going. Yeah, because we have a different culture, and we have a different Bible translation, and we speak a different language. You don't like us. You don't bring us the bagels. I see how this works. I don't know, but what I do know is that it caused gungusma. You say, is that a disease? Well, kind of. <laughs> it's the word in our text that says, there arose a complaint. The word complaint in the Greek is gungusma. It just, it's an onomatopoetic word. It sounds like its definition, you know. Just, if you just say it, gungusma. Mom, what are we having for lunch today? Hot dogs, gungusma. <laughs> right? See, it's the same word actually in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament, that it was used when the people were complaining against Moses. The people complained against Moses, gungusma, gungusma. It's this murmuring that's going on. So this wasn't just, hey, somebody missed me with the bagel. It was, yeah, gungusma. All right, so there's this, this whining going on. There's this complaining that's taking place, as in the days of Moses. Now, it's fascinating to think about what the apostles did not do and what they did do. Here are some things they did not do. They did not procrastinate. You know, there are people who really like to make decisions by indecision. <laughs> they drive me crazy. You know, they just keep putting it off, 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 and they hope if they put it off long enough, then that will make the decision for them. That is not decision making. The, the apostles did not procrastinate. They also did not form a committee, which is the longest way to take care of any particular problem. Now, there are, I, you know, I'm a little sarcastic. No, I'm a lot sarcastic, but committees sometimes can be helpful. I'm, I'm for them to a certain extent, but they didn't just form a, a, you know, a study committee of this particular thing. They didn't split. The church didn't split. They didn't say, okay, there's going to be a Greek church and there's going to be a Hebrew church. The Protestant fragment, fragmentation spirit had not yet started, you might say. They didn't simply shun the Greek-speaking widows. They didn't put it to a vote. They didn't take an authoritarian stance. These were the apostles of Jesus Christ, sent by Christ himself. You know what they could have said? They, stood, they could have said, hey, we're the apostles. What we do is right. If we ever do anything wrong, see rule one. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, that's how some people are. They, they get this authoritarian mindset, and, and they think they can do no wrong. They didn't have that. They dealt with it. Now, I, I was thinking this week about how to take the dis out of dysfunction. Because, the, and, and this is true in families and it's true in churches. You know, everybody is from a dysfunctional family. Like, you're all like, not me. I'm Dutch. <laughs> you know, you can't be dysfunctional in Dutch. Oh, yeah, you can be Dutch functional, you know. You <laughs> 
That, there's a whole lot of that going around. But anyway, you, how do you get the dis out of dysfunctional? And here's how. You deal with it. Everybody's got stuff. Everybody's got closets with stuff. And, and, and the thing is, in dysfunctional families, everybody knows the stuff is in there, but nobody wants to say anything about it. A functional family says, all right, that's it. Skeleton in the 20-yard dumpster. You deal with it. And dysfunctional churches have the same problem. You know, there's an elephant in the room, and nobody wants to deal with it. You kick the dis out of dysfunction by dealing with it. And this is what was happening now. The apostles are like, well, we can't have this. <laughs> we're we're going to deal with this. So here are their growth plans, you might say, and you're not going to believe this, what happens. But number, growth plans are characterized by confession. Verse 2, I think what you have here is this implied confession of their failure. Then the 12 summoned the multitude and said, it's, it's, it, you know, it's not reasonable that we do this particular thing. I'll explain that verse a little bit more in a minute. But they were saying, you know what, we've missed it here. We've missed it. I think there's a confession on their part, a confession of their failure, at least implied, but a confession of their humanity for sure. Now, if you look at this verse, it, it looks like the apostles thought themselves a little bit above, and so that's why the translation really needs to be clarified. They say, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Well, la-di-da. What is up with that? Well, here's the, a better translation of the word desirable would be reasonable. In other words, it's not reasonable that we can do both of these things. It's not reasonable, it's not even human that we can do this part over here and do this part over here. I think what they're implying is both of these things are very important. The administration of this meeting of a need is extremely important, but so is the ministry of the word. And we are going to have to deal with this, with all of this, because it all matters, but it's not reasonable to think that anybody can do it by themselves. It's not human. So there's this confession, you see, of finitude, you might say. Number, uh, our letter B, there's, there's humility in verse number three. And you, you notice it says, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. In other words, they really believed that the rest of the people who were also immersed in the Holy Spirit had the ability to sort this out. They were willing to defer allowing people to participate with the Holy Spirit in a solution. Now, I, I, I'm gonna, maybe this is a general statement, so I wanna be careful how I say this. But I think most of us are probably conservative in our politics. And what that, what that means in many cases is, is that we sort of loathe big government. All right? In other words, we'd like the government to just facilitate life in this country. We don't want them to have this sort of top-down, like, you people are stupid and we have it figured out in Washington, D.C. We know what life is about and how to live it. Here's the rules, right? We, I mean... Okay. I don't know. Okay, so maybe you like that model. I don't, I, that's fine. You're cool. All right. But even if we are conservative and we don't like that sort of top-down mentality, sometimes we end up doing that in the church. And we have this idea, and, I, and I'm not necessarily talking about here. I'm just saying the church historically, we have this idea that, you know, ministry professionals are the ones who have to figure stuff out because I got REV in front of my name, which just means reverse, but, you know, um, reverend, as if that gave me some power of, you know, insight that nobody else has. There's a sense of humility here among the apostles. They were, they were willing to defer allowing other people to participate with the Holy Spirit in a solution. They gave direction, and that's the third thing. They said, okay, you know what? Choose some people from among yourself, but make sure you pick the right people. Pick the right people. They suggested a number. There may be something more to the number seven than I know about, but I, I, I'm not going into all that. They said that pick seven guys 
that are qualified. Now, why the qualifications? Because this is very important, and it's true for our deacons today, by the way, and our elders. Meeting the needs of widows in this context would include managing money. Managing money. It would include hearing stories. It would include serving women who were in a very vulnerable place. A work that sensitive needed men of character, not those who wanted character. Now, you know, there's, there's all kinds of men who want character. You know, I don't know too many men that go, oh, yeah, I just want to be a louse. I want to be a slug. I want to be untrustworthy. I want nobody to like me. I want to influence. No. Most everybody wants to be thought of as good, but only a few people in the world will give themselves to being good. And what he says here is this. Look for the guys that have given themselves to developing their character, those who already demonstrated it. And then note this term. This is very fascinating. In verse number three, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you. The the literal word is visit. And I think what he's saying is this. Go visit where they live and see if they are people of character. Go to their house. Go where they work. Go to their vendors. See if they pay their bills. See if they're the kind of people that are trustworthy. Visit them. See that they are men of good reputation, men of testimony, men that have no word against them, you might say. Men full of the Spirit, and Paul would later give us what that means. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, of course, meekness, faith, self-control, wisdom. Lenski said, wisdom is the ability and readiness to apply God's truth and God's ways to the practical matters of life. Discernment. So we have here a picture of early church organization, and I do like what John MacArthur said about this. He said, organization is never an end in itself, but only a means to facilitate what the Lord is doing in his church and their local community. Now, this whole business of organization in the church has ditches on both sides of the road. You know, there there are churches that are so organized, and they, they have a strategic plan. They got a three ring notebook that thick, you know, and everybody's got their goals and everybody's got their thing, and everybody's, it's just. <laughs> Sorry. You know how I feel about that, all right? And then, and then there's churches on the other side that, that have, they, they don't have a three ring notebook, they don't even have any paper. They're just willy nilly. Everybody's just kind of going about doing their own, every, every man doing what is right in his own eyes. That's just craziness. Those are the ditches on both sides of the road. Organization is never an end in itself. It can become that, but it is necessary to facilitate the work that the Lord is doing in his church and their local community. But the organization and administration is only as good as the people that occupy those positions. Now, this is very interesting. Note that it is very likely that the people who brought the complaint were given the responsibility to find the solution. Oh, I love this. I'm telling you, I love this more than I should love this. Seek out from among you. You see that? He's saying, all right, you guys identified the problem. Find the solution. (laughs) I love it. I just love it. Be careful what you complain about, friends. Or what you identify as a need. You may be the one assigned to fix it. Now this is beautiful in verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Everybody was happy. (laughs) Yeah. Snapshot. Yeah. Take the picture. Put it on Instagram because this is rare. Everybody was happy happy with the decision. So they came back with seven men, interestingly, seven men who were going to minister to culturally Greek widows, and all of them have Greek names. All of them have Greek names. And one guy, the last one, was a Gentile. He had converted to Judaism in Antioch, 
And then he had converted to Christianity when he got to Jerusalem. I bet his parents thought, this kid's never gonna make up his mind. <laughs> you know, he's, uh, he's up in Antioch in Syria someplace. He's, a, he's just a pagan Gentile, and he learns about the monotheism of Judaism and the good ways of God's law, and he says, yeah, I wanna get in on that. And so he converts to Judaism, and then he gets to Jerusalem, and he hears about the risen Christ, and that he's the fulfillment of what Israel had been teaching all this time, and he gets it, and he converts to Christ. His name is Nicholas, and he becomes one of these guys ministering to people of the dispersion in Jerusalem. This inclusion, you see, was recognition that this work that God is doing is a lot bigger than us. A lot bigger than the few of us. The apostles were acknowledging, wow, I think God wants to do something really big here. We better get our hands off it. They brought them before the apostles, and the apostles did two simple things that were very meaningful. One, they prayed for them. And I think their prayer was an acknowledgement of gratitude. You know, I, I feel like that about so many of you that are serving in this ministry, just as, as an aside. I, I thank God for you. We're, this year, we're going to need about 80 people to do vacation Bible school, just to pull this thing off. And there's going to be a roster put together of adults that are serving and working behind the scenes and all this kind of stuff. I am just so glad, because I want to tell you something. If 180 kids show up here on that first Sunday night, and it's, it's Bart and I, <laughs> there's Robitussin going in the Kool-Aid. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> We're going to drug those children. I can't handle it. 180 kids, two adults, men. Here's the ball. You know, have fun. I don't know. It'd be horrible. So, yeah, I think the apostles were getting a bit overwhelmed with everything that was going on, and they, they were just thankful that God had raised up other people to join them in this work. They blessed them. It says that they laid hands on them. This is a symbol that was in the Old Testament. It's a symbol in the New Testament. We still do this, by the way, a symbol of, of approval, of blessing, a symbol of authority. These seven were now representatives of Jesus, as were the 12. They were not apostles, but they were representatives of the apostles and of the apostolic work and of the work of the kingdom. This shared responsibility and this shared blessing should be characteristic of local churches that acknowledge that all believers are immersed into and filled with the Holy Spirit of God and therefore capable of ministry. Now I want you to notice the third thing in this text and that is these growth priorities. What were the priorities? What were the big things? Well, verse 4, as I said, may cause you to think that the apostles saw the administration of money and food distribution as beneath them, but that is not the case. What we learn here is that prayer, serving the Word, and pastoral care or social care were the priorities of the church. Not one over the other, but all of them. See, if serving these widows didn't matter, they'd have just pushed this thing off to the side. They didn't say it didn't matter. They raised it to a level of importance and said, we've got to figure out how to deal with this thing. They weren't minimizing the importance of it. They were raising it up and saying, yes, it's just as important as the things that we are doing, but no one person can do it all. The apostles had been commissioned and gifted for two main things, prayer and the ministry of the Word. So the first priority is that we each find our place and we do what God has given us to do. That's, I think, job one. I'm not an apostle, and these guys in this text, though they're often called deacons, we're not really deacons. They might have been the prototype of the deacons. But there are some parallels here in this matter. The truth is, there are some of us that are set apart for prayer and the serving of the word. The word prayer in the text here is the word for worship. And of course, a big part of worship, of the recognition of God and the celebration of God and, the th and gratitude to God, that a big part of that is prayer. And we should all worship and pray, but some of us are set apart vocationally for that purpose. You, 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 some of you should probably say to some of us sometimes, don't just do something, pray. 
Now, I recognize that prayer is doing something, but I, I, I think most of you know how hard it is to really see prayer as being meaningful. If you stopped by here someday and I was sitting in one of the green chairs in my office and I was sitting here like this and I was praying and you peeked in and said, hey, Velda, he's not doing anything. (laughs) You know what I would do? I know what I should do. But you know what I would do? I'd say, yeah, I'm sorry, what do you need? You got a tire you need to change? You got some tables you need to move? Because doing something seems to be more meaningful and valuable than praying. I don't know whether you knew it or not, but we need prayer. (laughs) We need prayer. And some of us need to give ourselves to prayer because it really is doing something. To pray with people, to pray for people, to teach people to pray is a big part of what the church needs. The ministry of the word is mentioned here. It's a very interesting word. He says in verse, um, uh, let's see, we will, verse four, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. The word ministry is the same word that's used in verse two where he says, leave the word of God and serve tables. So what he says is, there is the serving of tables and there is the serving of the word. Same exact word. They're both on the same level. It's not that there's one that's higher than the other, it's just that some are given to serving tables, to the administration, to the management, to the doing of the thing, and there are some who are to serve the word. Those of us that are teachers are servers of the word. I was actually thinking about getting one of those little black aprons that a a waitress wears, wearing it today, just to freak you out a little bit, and have a little tablet thing in there and a whole bunch of pens. And I was going to step out here for an introduction this morning and go, Hi, I'm Mark. I'll be serving you today. Today's special is Acts 6, 1 through 7 in the New King James Version. And... uh, there's nothing else. And no, you don't get fries with that. I'll get that right in for you. Okay, that's, I was going to kind of start like, because that's really my job, you know. My job is to serve you a meal. And there's no fast food when it comes to this stuff. I, I had somebody come up to me after the first service and said, thank you for not giving us a frozen dinner. <laughs> you know. I have a a thing that my mom gave me when I was installed here. Did you know I was installed here? That sounds so, I don't know, like I'm a fixture or something. But I have this, when I was installed here at Calvary, my mom got me this piece of artwork, and it's it's a kitchen, and it says Mark's Kitchen. There's the word and prayer. And that is honestly part of my, I, I know some of you think I don't do anything but drink coffee all week and talk once on Sunday, but seriously, there's some work to this business of serving the word. Now, it's simply not reasonable then to expect a few people to do everything. It isn't human. This might sound rather shocking to some of you, but P- Peter probably didn't visit every widow. What? He used to visit all the time. He used to visit all the widows. Yeah, when there were 20. Now there's 500. Well, weenie. (laughs) Why can't you get around and do more, Peter? You're filled with the Holy Spirit for Pete's sake. (laughs) Sorry about that. That was really bad. But you get my point, this isn't human at some point. So I and others with this vocation will give ourselves to prayer and the word, and you should all give yourselves to your vocation. Now when I say vocation, I don't mean occupation, and I don't mean that you need to change your occupation. I put a little note in the bullets in there, there's a little number one, and then down at the bottom it says, by vocation I mean your unique giftedness, your unique calling. 
See, some of you, all of you, everybody that has the gift of the Holy Spirit has some unique niche, some place. And it doesn't matter what you're really getting paid to do. It doesn't matter what your, your full-time job during the day may be. Your vocation overlays all of that. Now, if you ever get the chance to have your vocation and your occupation line up, woo! Do a happy dance in the foyer. <laughs> but that doesn't happen very often, very honestly. Very honestly, quite often, our occupation is what we do to put bread on the table and to put gas in the tank and to pay the mortgage. Our vocation is how God wired us, and it just sort of comes out of us wherever we go. My, my wife's vocation is, is, is encouragement. It's, it's not office management. It's not media development or any of that kind of stuff. My wife's vocation in life is to, is to welcome people and to help people and to encourage people. She's just doing it all the time. If you know her, if you don't know her, just stand around for a while. She'll be to you. Hi, I'm Diane. You know, I mean, it'll happen eventually. When I was 18, I was a, a, a freshman at Northwestern Michigan College, and I wanted to go to church on Wednesday night to go to prayer meeting, and I walked into a church in Traverse City, and I met this girl, and she said, hi, I'm Diane. You want to sit with us? And I thought that was a little forward, but I said yes. <laughs> I married the girl. Because, you see, that's just who she is. It's what she does. She wasn't flirting. I mean, I, I don't think. I, I, I'm not really sure. I think she was just getting over some other bum. But in any case, <laughs> I think she's over looking for a husband now. So don't any of you guys, if she's like, you know, hi, I'm Diane. Want to sit with me? Just. Anyway, I'm really off task here now. <laughs> hmm. The thing is this. You should all give yourselves to your vocation. It, it's how God wired you. It's according to your gifting. And you should make your vocation a priority so that we can all get on with growing up into Christ individually and corporately. You can read about that in Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12. We're a body and every piece of the body has its own particular place. Now if the apostles had drifted from their calling, their vocation, the church would have drifted as well. Because we access the power and direction of God through prayer and we are protected from the blowing winds of stray doctrine by sound teaching. I'm very thankful that we have a structure here at Calvary that affords us the time and the means to keep the main things the main things. They did this, this early church. And verse 7 describes what happened. Then, after they dealt with this thing that they had in front of them, the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and great many of even the priests were obedient to the faith. <laughs> People, we would have said, yeah, they're never getting it. They're never coming in. Even they became obedient to the faith. Now, what happened here? Just, just a quick recap of the priorities. Number one, deal with conflict. Endeavor, the Scripture says, to maintain the unity. That means we have to work at this thing. We can't just run away. We can't walk away. Because dealing with conflict is the best way to minimize distractions and that which dissipates energy. Deal with the conflict. Number two, Fulfill your vocation, your calling, your place. We're all called to ministry. It, it, it's, it's not just people who get paid to do this that, are, that are, are, are called to ministry. We're all called to ministry. All of us. Fulfill your vocation. Number three, adjust structure to what the Spirit is doing. That's, that's a priority. That we, if we get stuck in one particular model or way of doing things, we're not being responsive to the work of the Holy Spirit. Warren Wiersbe said, it is tragic 
when churches destroy ministry because they refuse to modify their structure. Of course, this is especially hard for people who don't like change. Number four, we must keep prayer and the serving of the Word as a priority without neglecting care for one another. It all matters. A local church without prayer and Word and care for one another is not long for this earth. They all matter. Functional homes and functional churches flourish with common principles because we are a family and we have a father, a good one. So let's make it our aim to please him. Will you bow with me in prayer, please? Our Father, thank you for the church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to those who will yield to him. Lord, I I pray that every church in this area, the greater Greenville area, will be flourishing. There's really only one church, I know, but I mean each local embodiment of that, Lord, I, I pray that there will be attention paid to the main things. And I pray that each of us within this local church might really spend enough time with you to learn our own vocation, to find out why we're here, what we're doing. Lord, I I recognize that some folks just go to their job and make their money and, and endure for a long time. And I pray that you'd help them to see that even within that occupation, there can be the fulfillment of their vocation. They might be the person you designed them to be wherever they are, here or out there, wherever it may be. Help us, Lord, to find our place in your body, our place in your kingdom, to do what you built us to do. Thank you for how how many people already do that here. I'm not implying they don't. I'm just praying that we'll continue to find out who we are in your good grace and live in light of it. So, anyway, we offer ourselves to you, Father. We offer this church to you. Pray that you'd use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.